Good evening, everybody. Welcome to Whitbeck Bennett Presents Parents in Education. This is the second part of our three-part series involving education law. Today, we're going to have a great discussion about special education law and IEPs and all of the different things that go along with that. We're going to do this for about an hour to make sure that everybody is out of here on, in a good amount of time. And so the meeting will promptly end at 8 p.m. And we're happy to have you all here. A little bit about uh, our firm before we get started. Whitbeck Bennett is a national law firm founded in 2020 by myself and a few others. We have offices in Texas, Virginia, Oklahoma, Maryland, D.C., and Delaware. And we're very proud to bring our education law practice across the country. And for those of you that don't know what education law is, it's several practice areas that we do as a firm. Title IX, which many of you are familiar with, uh, especially Loudoun County, Freedom of Information Act cases, student and staff disciplinary issues, gifted education, IEPs, special education, special permissions, and boundary disputes. And tonight we're going to be focusing with three of us. Debbie Rose, our education consultant. Debbie, why don't you give us a little background? Hi, thanks, John. Uh, real excited to be here tonight. I um, have a background of work being a, an attorney on the Hill and uh, for a, a congressional committee. But at some point as a mom in my um, area of Loudoun County, I decided I wanted to be more involved in my kids' education and ran for school board and was elected and reelected and spent eight years on the school board and uh, happy to bring my legal background and uh, my experience as a school board member to this new work with uh, Whitbeck Bennett and to help parents in all areas of education law. Thank you, Debbie. We also have tonight our partner, Elizabeth Lancaster. Elizabeth, why don't you give us a little bit about your background? Thank you, John. Hi, folks. When I initially became a practicing attorney here in Loudoun County, I was primarily focused in criminal law, very specifically related to juveniles. Spent about 15 years doing juvenile delinquency matters. One of the things, the most common themes I heard from many of my clients and their parents was, my kid's on an IEP, I need help, or my kid got in trouble in school, I need help. And there was almost never anyone to refer them to. It didn't seem like that was a practice area that many attorneys were involved in. One of the first things I did when I came and joined with Beck Bennett was because there was this focus on education law and this uh, desire to kind of formulate this uh, this area of the law here in Loudoun County. And, and as we've seen in, in the last couple of years, it's been uh, tremendously in need and important. And so I'm just so proud to be a part of this practice as we build out our education law here. Thank you, Elizabeth. A little bit about myself. I've been practicing law in Northern Virginia for a little over 20 years. Used to be a professor of law at George Mason Law School in Arlington and used to direct the George Mason Law and Mental Illness Clinic. About five years ago, I got really into special education law education law in general and really excited to bring our expertise to y'all in this area which as you know has been an incredible mover and shaker in education uh, issues over the last few years so very excited to be with y'all tonight and uh, let's get started so first of all when we talk about education law let's talk about what it means Essentially, education law is a conglomerate of a lot of different areas of law, most notably Title IX, which is a statute that's been around for a long time, since 1972, but has more relevance in the, in the most recent times as a prohibition against sex-based discrimination in any school or program that receives federal funding. In Loudoun County, where we're based primarily, this has a special relevance because it's, it's a lot of the cases that have been going on in Loudoun County have centered around Title IX and, and pro prohibitions against sexual assault. Freedom of Information Act cases, which are basically a, a federal statute that talks about the ability of us to get information from our government that's previously unreleased. And uh, we've done a lot of those cases in our firm. VFOIA, which is the state equivalent of the Freedom of Information Act, and is a set of laws in our in our commonwealth which talks about getting information from our state government school employment we do a lot of cases involving employment of teachers administrators and personnel of our schools 
This is talks about workplace discrimination, Title IX, anything disciplinary action, anything that would ha happen to a, an employee of a school in Northern Virginia, we do. Gifted education, like the type of programs that go to gifted and talented students. And then, of course, the big one we're talking about tonight, special education and individualized education plans and 504 plans. Something that we know a lot about, something we're going to talk about tonight. Education law includes special permissions, that is, students being assigned to different schools and those that they would normally be assigned to by the boundaries, boundary disputes, and student discipline. So tonight, we're going to talk about special education. We're going to talk about IEPs, the IDEA, Section 504, the ADA, uh, the different processes involved with all these, and what laws govern special education. And we hope tonight's topics will be relevant to you. And hopefully you'll get a lot of good information out of tonight. So with that, let's turn it over to our, our team and let's, let's get started. What is special education? I think generally we all kind of know what that is, but in particular, it is instruction that is specifically designed to meet the unique needs of a child with disabilities. Uh, it can consist of an individualized type of curriculum with differentiated educational goals or a same curriculum as non-disabled students, but with adaptions. Uh, so a student may need different types of tools to reach the same sorts of the same content goals as other students, like counting tools, audio content, or maybe extra time for testing. The ADA, you know, we hear it referred to often, and um, the ADA, which most of you probably already know, refers to the Americans with Disabilities Act. It applies to school settings to prevent discrimination against students and employees with disabilities. You have the definition on the screen, but know that it covers a broad range of identified disabilities from ADHD to dyslexia to significant physical and mental disabilities. The ADA requires schools to ensure that all programs, services, and activities are accessible to students with disabilities. Parents and guardians must ask schools to accommodate their student through differentiated teaching methods or tools, assistance to access materials, like again, like audiobooks versus physical, or request formalized instructional plans. It's important to understand the nomenclature used in special education, and you'll hear a lot of terms tonight that um, the definitions are important to understand as you walk through this process. For instance, accommodations change how a student will reach the content, Modifications change what a student will learn. These terms become important when developing the formal learning plan like a 504 or an Individualized Education Plan or IEP. An IEP is an Individualized Education Program or plan that is developed between the school, special education staff, and parents that's done after a series of tests to determine the disability. The accommodations and modifications are formalized to meet specific educational goals and it's important to note that this is a legally binding document once it is agreed upon and signed by all the parties. The type of IEP that would be used can be either traditional or standard, uh, or standards-based, and will be determined specifically by the student's disabilities and the educational goals outlined. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Elizabeth Lancaster, who's going to walk through the process of how to obtain an IEP. Thank you, Debbie. It's kind of timely that we actually are having this um, <laughs> this uh, town hall tonight. A member of the Real Housewives of Loudoun County and the Real Ladies of Loudoun County uh, on Facebook, and just this very morning, I uh, was you know scrolling through as I do, and there was a question from a parent. You know, hey, I have my kid's first eligibility meeting for an IEP. I had talked to an attorney; they're not available. What do I do? What are the recommendations? And I think. You know, and it had, you know, almost 100 responses very quickly early this morning. And so as we're talking about this process and as we're talking about how an attorney can help you, I'll just say this. There are certain situations in life where I say, don't ever go anywhere without an attorney. In criminal cases, never walk into a courtroom without an attorney, uh, mediation, those types of things. IEP can be a little bit different. For instance, how can an attorney help you with, with each of these steps? And as we go through these steps, we'll talk a little bit about how you can have assistance, and we'll get a little bit more into that later. So really, step number one is an evaluation. 
we call this colloquially a, a child study. And really anybody can ask for a child study. Anybody who's interacted with a child, be it the teacher, somebody else at the school, um, a parent, anybody can say, hey, look, I, you know, I've kind of noticed this thing with Susie. She's having some difficulty reading or she's, you know, not processing her math facts particularly well. Let's do a child study. And that child study, again, can be initiated by anybody within that milieu. Again, you know, teacher or somebody else at the school or a parent. You are entitled to ask if, as a parent, you have concerns that that maybe your child is not meeting milestones appropriately, you are entitled to go to the school and say, I want this child study done, and they're required to do so. And really what that accomplishes is, is they will go in and, and take some significant time to have somebody in the classroom observing, reviewing test scores. Sometimes they will do additional evaluations if there are concerns about something specific like dyslexia. There are tests that they take to determine whether or not a child kind of meets that criteria. If there are concerns about emotional disabilities, you know, just like you would do an evaluation for mental health evaluation, they, they look at various aspects to see whether or not maybe an emotional disability is preventing a, a child from meeting their educational goals. Again, that can be in classroom, that can be meeting with the school uh, therapist or counselor, that can be taking actual, having the child do actual physical tests or evaluations. And then they compile all that information together to make a determination whether or not a child is eligible. Is a child eligible? And, and we'll get into a little bit more between the differences of an IEP and a 504. They really kind of look at different aspects. But is a child eligible for an IEP? Typically, what a school is looking at is 13 specific different learning disabilities. Again, that can be you know, executive functioning disorder where you're having some difficulty, you know, step one, pick up my pencil, step two, read the sentence, step three, do the, you know, do the math. Or is it, you know, something like dyslexia where there's that, you know, difficulty in decoding or coding words. And there are multiple different types of learning disabilities. So they will make that determination. Now, there are the educational disabilities, but then there are other things that can affect your ability to learn in a classroom. So those could be, you know, anything in that broader scope of disabilities that can include not only learning disabilities, uh, but that can include physical disabilities, medical disabilities that make learning in a classroom environment a little bit more difficult. And then also emotional disabilities, uh, students who are dealing with mental health, like depression or anxiety that may impact a person's ability to perform the way they should in a classroom. So they you know, take their tests, they do their observ observations, and then determine whether or not you meet or your child meets the eligibility under one of those criteria. And that's a decision that's made by kind of that broad team. So it's, it's going to be the professionals, again, the teachers, the evaluators um, who are going to look at that and say, yep, you know, if you got to score six out of 10 on the test, they scored a seven, they meet that eligibility. So once a child is determined to have a disability or to meet that eligibility for an IEP, the school has 30 days to come together and, and make an IEP plan. Now, really what that IEP plan is, and, and if you've ever looked at an IEP plan, there's a lot of pages and it's kind of complicated, but really what you're looking at is what are the disabilities, what supports can we put into place to help those disabilities, and what are our education goals? How are we going to provide these either accommodations or modifications to make sure that our kids are meeting these goals? And, and those goals can be different depending on the disability. It could be how can we get the kid to meet, you know, kind of your standard of learning goals that every kid learns? Or, you know, again, depending on the disability, what are our goals and how do we meet those goals? Again, once we've made that, that determination, an IEP meeting is held. And there are a couple of things that the school is required to do. You know, parents are an absolute fundamental part of the IEP process. They have full voice and they have full ability or should have the full, full ability to participate. So the school, when they're setting an IEP meeting and, and they've got to do it within that 30 day window, you know, they've got to make sure that they are accommodating the parents' schedule, making sure they're reaching out, making sure the parents have the, the ability to participate. You know, one of the problems that we'll talk about in a little bit is you know, sometimes when you have language barriers, English is a second language, or, you know, parents who have to work three jobs in order to keep food on the table, 
those are the struggles in being able to get those parents in and, and participating in, in their children's IEP process. But the school is required to, to kind of take those steps to make that happen. Everyone's got to be aware of the purpose, time of the meeting, the ability to participate fully in the meeting if an interpreter is necessary or, you know, virtual is necessary because somebody has to appear from work. The school has to be able to set that up. And during that meeting, the IEP is written and all of the participants have a voice, as I said, but also kind of have to come to an agreement. And so, you know, this is where I, I would suggest um, having an attorney or an advocate can really benefit when there is ultimately a fundamental disagreement about what should be in the IEP, accommodations, modifications, quite frankly, the, the nature of the disability. And then what steps are we taking? And then as the IEP progresses, are the schools giving the modifications or accommodations to keep those kids hitting their goals? You know, what is the Individuals with Disability Act? This is kind of our federal statute that says, you know, hey, every kid is entitled to a free and public education, but every kid's a little bit different. And so, you know, well, you know, there's kind of your mainstream and, and we can kind of have the same plan for them. You know, if somebody is not fitting into that mainstream mold, we still have to provide them not only a good education, but a free education and access to that education. Um, and so we have to provide these accommodations. So these are, again, children with educational disabilities, children with physical disabilities, or just generally disabilities to get, get them progressing. So you know, accommodations for somebody with dyslexia is going to be very different than accommodations for somebody who is, you know, hearing impaired or, or visually impaired. But again, the, the IDEA is kind of our broad framework where we look at that and say, you have to provide this free and fair public education. And if you don't, it's really a civil rights violation for students. So really the stated purpose, as I said, you know, again, free and fair public education, meeting students' unique needs. It's interesting how the IDEA has kind of subsumed this IEP process. Um, random aside, and I'll be very quick about this. I was actually at the nail salon getting a pedicure and sat next to a woman whose grandmother was the woman who had originally founded this notion of IEPs and had written a lot of the federal laws about it. And in her mind, the IEP process was originally intended for every student, that every single student should be able to have kind of this team meeting. How do they learn best? What can the school do to accommodate that? At the end of the day, obviously, that really wasn't what happened, but but the IDEA and how that was implemented was to kind of subsume this IEP process and put in this process so that each student, regardless of their disability or needs, could have their needs met in what we call the least restrictive setting, meaning that, you know, we're not going to put all these kind of kids in one school and all these kind of kids in another school. No, we are going to have one public school, free and fair for everyone and mainstream these, these children as best as we can with the, again, accommodations and modifications that are needed. Uh, I would say the IDA also can, is part of the, the funding process so that each school district has the funding to ensure that, you know, the kids are receiving that fair and fair and free education. It's not just for the students, but also, again, for the schools to have the budgeting necessary to, to incorporate the, you know, additional learning or the additional accommodations, the additional teachers needed so that each student's needs are met. It's also for the parents to have the necessary tools needed so that they can assist with their child with disabilities to meet those public school needs. That could be um, separate busing to specific localities. That could be um, special equipment for students in the home to get to the school and in the school and then brought home. Giving parents the, those access to those materials is also what's required under the IDEA. And then obviously to ensure the effectiveness of, of of teaching to all students, truly, uh, ch children with disabilities in particular, but that, that ultimately ben benefits all students. So Section 504 is a little bit different. When we talk about Section 504, more broadly, we when we talk about the people with disabilities, I think that we were thinking, um, you know, along the lines of the ADA. So you can't be excluded from any anything that receives federal assistance, which is everything on the basis of a disability and, and and from this perspective if you want to think about it like you know again somebody who is blind or you know visually impaired or hearing impaired somebody who uses a wheelchair somebody um, who has severe epilepsy and so may 
need certain modifications and accommodations. We look at these two different things a little bit differently when we are looking at IEPs. You know, we're kind of focusing specifically on educational disabilities or disabilities that cause an issue with education. With 504, we're more thinking about, you know, a broader category of disabilities that may also affect a student's ability to be in a classroom in the least restrictive way. So they they work together, these, you know, the IDEA as well as Section 504. The plans are a little bit different. You know, the modifications and accommodations can be a little bit different. But that's really the kind of the two the two groups that we have here. Okay, so again, if you if you want to read through, um, I'm certainly not going to read it to you. Uh, you know, you can read through. These are different federal laws. You know, again, IDEA. We're talking, you know, specifically about individuals with disabilities, educational disabilities, and this provides the federal funding for special education to states. Anyone that receives financial funding or federal financing, which again is pretty much everyone. Section 504, again, we're talking about individuals with disability, and that's a broader category than just um, education, but this is really, in the Department of Education, this is more of a, a civil rights issue. This is a fundamental civil right to, despite having some disability, I still have the right to, you know, this, this education and, and to have the accommodations necessary. And again, the Americans with Disability Act, again, this is even the bigger, broader umbrella that goes beyond schooling. This is administered by the Department of Justice. And again, protecting against discrimination against that or for anybody with a disability. Again, this is where we're starting to talk about, do I need a lawyer? Do I need an advocate? Um, I will say, you know, in preparation for this um, particular town hall and from my own experience as a parent, I have two children, both of them went through a child study process. One of them now has an IEP. Here I am an attorney who specifically does special education advocacy. And I myself encountered some struggles in trying to get the accommodations that I needed. Many of you may or may not know, and I want to say it was uh, maybe late 2020. Um, oh, sorry, I literally it was so sorry. It was March 9th, 2022. Um, one of our highest level special education administrators in Loudoun County Public Schools resigned. She wrote this really long resignation letter. One of the reasons she resigned was really, there was some employment, you know, hostile work environment stuff there, but really where, you know, she drew the line was, I see certain kids who are getting the benefits and certain kids who aren't. I've tried to fix this gap, fill this gap, and I've gotten pushback when I've done that. You know, fundamentally from a moral, ethical standard, I can't continue to work in this environment where I can't help try to fill that gap. And one of the things that she said, she saw was the biggest issue is that Children who had access to an attorney or access to an advocate resoundingly got the services that their children were entitled to. And here's the takeaway from that. You know, it's twofold. Obviously, this is a systemic problem. But at the same time, you know, I'm a parent. I have children. You know, there, there is the beneficial and the altruistic, I want great education for all, but there's also the personal, I want my children well-educated now. You know, one of those takeaways is, you know, when you come with an advocate or an attorney, 99.9% .9 of the time, you are going to get the accommodations that you need. And it does not have to be this adversarial, you know, aggressive process until it does. You know, again, our recommendations are you interact cooperatively. Everyone really is on the same team until you're not. Cooperation does generally get better outcomes. Uh, even dealing with negotiations with other attorneys, you know, I have found you kill more fly or what is the expression? Win more flies of honey. Um, and, and that is true to a point. You know, sometimes you have to get the back up against the wall. But, but cooperation up into a point, keeping an open mind, working together does tend to produce better outcomes. And if there are things that are happening that you're, you're just not being successful with, you know, that may be when you need to call in a hired gun. I will tell you, so, you know, my first child's IEP process, we had requested a child study. I didn't think my son was reading, you know, he wasn't hitting his DRA marks. I had some concerns. Did a child study for about a year and a half. He didn't really meet any requirements, but they said, hey, let's come back next year and check his scores. And ultimately, after a year and a half, we determined he, did, he, he didn't really have any eligibility for IEP. He probably needed a swift kick in the pants to, 
be a little bit more proactive on reading. When my daughter then came to kindergarten, it was different. It was actually a teacher who said to us, hey, I think we should do a child study for your daughter. Um, now, again, this was all mixed into COVID. And so that obviously complicated a lot of things. And what she was having difficulty with was reading and suspected dyslexia. And we'll get into that in a minute too. But the problem was it wasn't just the dyslexia and the reading. It was that because she couldn't read, it would give her tremendous anxiety. And so she was exhibiting a lot of anxiety symptoms in school. And so it became this, what came first, the chicken or the egg? Is she dyslexic and can't read? Or is her anxiety so bad about not reading that she can't focus on reading? And there were some contentious parts. And, you know, the, one of the teachers didn't agree. Ultimately, her IEP right now is solely for an emotional disability of, um, of anxiety. But her teacher firmly believes that she has dyslexia. Um, and the reason I mentioned this is during these IEP meetings, they kept kind of whispering to us like, hey, she, she doesn't meet this eligibility, but we're going to give her this dyslexia training anyway. I'll, you know, our special aid is specially trained in um, Orton and Gillingham, which is the OG, I'm probably saying that wrong, which is a specific training regarding dyslexia. And, and so we're going to give her all this extra dyslexia stuff. And it was almost like a secret, like they, they couldn't really talk about it, but they told us this is what they were going to be doing, even though the, really the only accommodations they were going to give her were related to her anxiety. And that didn't really sit well with me. And, and, and we're going to have to go back and we're going to see if she's meeting her goals. And, and that may be something that I, I come in gun bla guns blazing the next meeting. Ironically, as again, I was doing research for this particular town hall back in about 2016, 17. There was a huge outcry in Loudoun County because students were being matriculated, you know, from elementary school to eighth grade who were on a second grade uh, reading level. Uh, it was determined that Loudoun County had, you know, almost no training in implementing these tests to determine whether or not children had dyslexia. And then even if they were meeting those eligibility requirements, there wasn't a real countywide, system-wide you know, training for teachers so that they could then implement the accommodations and modifications that were needed for these students. And so you had kind of this generation of kids from like 2005 to 2015 who were graduating from high school functionally illiterate. Um, and when you talk about dyslexia, that actually affects, uh, I think the last day I saw was about one in five or one in six students. So that's not an insignificant portion of your student body that create, created a lot of uproar and you know, it did, it, it functionally created a lot of changes. I mean, it doesn't seem so much to me with my experience with my daughter, but, but really it did create a lot of changes, but there was that notion of great, you know, I stood up, I got mad, I fought, I hired an attorney, I, I made a stink. And so kids five, five years from now are going to have a better outcome. That doesn't help my kid now. And so when we talk about that notion of, you know, when do I need an advocate? When do I need an attorney? It's, great, we want to change the system, but also how can I help my child right this minute get what they need? So there are options when it comes to, you know, if there's a disagreement about what should be in an IEP, what accommodations, what modifications. Ultimately, my, my uh, kid's father and I agreed, you know, the IEP that's in place for Ryan right now is appropriate, the emotional disability, but let's reevaluate when we come back next year to see if she's hitting her milestones. But had we not agreed, and the school was refusing to do anything else, and we didn't agree with the, the recommendation, what's the next step? And one of those steps can be mediation. And so you can reach out to the Virginia Department of Education. They are required to pay for a mediator. That mediator then comes in, reviews all the documentation, talks to all the parties involved, and, and that makes a determination whether or not the school has, the school's in the right or whoever's in disagreement, who's in the right. And then what a plan is put in place to fix that. I will tell you, I had uh, a client recently who, after fighting for two years to get a child study, couldn't even get to the point of getting a child study, finally said, you know what, I'm hiring an attorney. I had the first, you know, meeting to request that child study. And quite frankly, just having an attorney log into the Zoom meeting all of a sudden, they determined that there should be a child study and, and a child study happened and that child now has an IEP. So those are some of the ways that even in a non-confrontational way, an attorney can help you through that process. Or through the mediation process, 
having somebody who has the ability to kind of explain the words, explain to you what your rights are, even if it's not necessarily in that confrontational way, you know that you are asking, you're able to advocate for what your child should get because you've been advised of what your child should get. And you're not relying on what's being told to you by the, by the school. You go to mediation, you don't get what you want. You want to file a complaint. So again, you can file through you know, Office of Dispute Resolution, Administrative Services, and it can be a violation of one or more things. It could be, are they violating the ADA? Are they violating the IDEA? Are they violating the 504? And you formally file a complaint with the Virginia Department of Education and say, hey, what is happening to my child is violating you know, their civil rights, their rights to a fair and free education. Again, they will assign an investigator to come in and formally investigate. And then if it's determined that, you know, the school messed up or whoever is doing the wrongdoing messed up, uh, they can file a corrective action plan and then enforce that corrective action plan within the school. The due process hearing is, again, if there is, you know, you file this formal complaint and then you kind of come into a hearing. Um, and a due process hearing is, is much like a trial, a criminal trial. I don't know if any watched, watched the Johnny Depp trial. You know, much like that, where you are calling witnesses, um, you are arguing about the law. What are my child's rights to a free and fair education? Has the school accommodated that? And if they haven't, why are they violating my child's civil rights, you know, to this free and, free and public education? You know, this is one of those moments, you know, I would suggest if you're having difficulties with the IEP, you're, you're going to want that advocate or attorney earlier on. But this is one of those situations, much like a criminal case, don't ever walk into a courtroom without an attorney. While it's an administrative hearing, so a little bit different, again, this is one of those situations where you want to hire uh, an advocate who knows the right words to say, knows the buzzwords, is able to comprehend your specific case facts, your facts in your case and how they differentiate maybe from something else, and can then articulate that professionally to the administrative judge who is then going to uh, render a determination. Q&A, I think we're going to move over to uh, Debbie Rose to go through the q and I just wanted to give kind of some, some final thoughts. Uh, we had talked last time at our last town hall about Title IX and a little bit about school discipline. There is a huge crossover between special education, school discipline, and Title IX. Previously at our last kind of, uh, you know, our last town hall, we talked about why you need an attorney, when you need an attorney, when it comes to school discipline, Title IX, anything along those lines. When you combine those two of uh, Title IX, school discipline, and, and special education, that's when you definitely need an advocate and an attorney. There is such a crossover there and so many steps the school has to follow that they routinely don't where your child may end up in a situation where they're not getting what they're entitled to. So with that, I'm going to send it over to Debbie, who's going to do some Q&A. And obviously, we are always here to help you with any of your special education need questions. Thanks. Thank you, Elizabeth. That was awesome. Thank you so much. All right. So we're moving on to the next slide. So we have three questions, um, pretty simple um, or fast and easy. So when is it better to request due process as opposed to filing a complaint? And this is interesting, um, timely, as Elizabeth and I have been working on a particular case about that has this kind of question. I'm going to ask Elizabeth to chime in first, and, and uh, maybe I'll have some other thoughts as well after she answers. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. Yes. When is it better to request due process as opposed to filing a complaint? I think that really is very factually specific. And again, there's not a real broad category of like, okay, if it's a, you know, a, a, a special needs child being removed from a school, you know, automatically that's due process or automatically that's filing a complaint. Um, and so even if you are reaching out to an advocate or an attorney simply to say, can I get, you know, here's a couple hundred, you know, dollars for your time of an hour. So you can tell me which one would be better. I think that's, that's the right way to go. I think ultimately it really depends on the facts of the case. Is this, is this simply a disagreement where I think Johnny should get 
an, an extra hour when he's taking a test? Or is this, you know, the Johnny requires a wheelchair and he can't get into his English class. You know, those are two very different um, kind of concepts and, and you're going to get um, better results one way or the other. So, I, you know, I, I wish there was a better answer other than give me a call. Um, but I think the answer is give me a call because really that is very fact dependent. I think I would add to before calling the attorney, it's helpful for um, potential clients, parents to really evaluate what their end goal is. So if their end goal is to find um, the appropriate school setting, be it a different school or a private school and find, you know, to get compensation or, you know, get reimbursement for those costs, things like that, that's something that, you know, maybe it isn't worth the heavy legal investment into filing a civil rights complaint in federal court, but going through a due process hearing where you're getting your, you're meeting your objectives in a cost-effective uh, way. Or if it is a situation where you're at a position to, you're in a place where that's it. We have been so aggrieved by this process. Our child has been so harmed by this that your, your goal is much different. So I think too, the goals are really also a part of that process. And it's important to have those kind of outlined and before you talk to your attorney. Yeah. And that's a great point, Debbie. And, and I'll suggest as well that there are some things that you have to do up front before you go through this complaint or due process process in order to get the outcome that you want. So that's fantastic advice. You want to, you want to know what your end game is because there may be some things you have to do, some notices you have to give the school um, in order to actually ask for that relief at the end. So great point, Debbie. So question number two, I think my child needs an IEP. Where do I start? Well, I mean, and so much like Elizabeth, I have, I have also done this process with one of my children. And while I was on the school board, I was the liaison the, uh, to the special education advisory committee, the pretty much the entire eight years that I was on the board and participated in task forces that were created as a result of some, not the incident that, not the dyslexia incident that um, Elizabeth mentioned, but certainly one around constraints and, um, you know, how to handle certain, uh, usually students that are um, going to be in a self-contained classroom and need uh, different kinds of interventions. So very familiar with, you know, parents as they're approaching this question. And I think I'll just start with, and I know Elizabeth has a lot more to add to it, but I'll start with, you know, yes, it starts at that IEP, but it doesn't, or, you know, you can do your child's study. You may end up at the, at the child's, at a, you know, the 504 plan, uh, which is something less than an IEP, or you may start at the IEP. You don't necessarily have to start at the lowest level. You can, you can have a goal of like an IEP. You don't have to go through a process of a child study that will get you a child study plan. And if that doesn't work, then you can go to the IEP. You don't have to do that. You know your child and, and where, where you feel they may have a specific disability and what accommodations and what kind of plan might best meet their needs. So don't be afraid to advocate for at that starting point, wherever that is. But yes, it does start with the evaluation. And um, I will let Elizabeth take it from there. You know, I would just say, just to kind of wrap it up, uh, lastly, yes, you know, you know your child best, or maybe I don't. With Jake, I was like, surely this kid needs some reading help. And, you know, I initiated. And then with my daughter, Ryan, the teacher was like, surely you know your daughter needs some help. That's kind of how it goes. But, um, you know, I think my child needs an IEP. It really starts with, you know, at least in my mind, you know, requesting that child study. If it's, you know, again, that, you know, suspected learning disability, you're going to know if your child, you know, has a significant medical concern or significant physical disability right from the get go. So that that's a little bit of a different thing. I think this question is more like, you know, hey, my second grade grader's not really, you know, hitting those reading milestones. And I think that's that's where you ask for that um, that child study. And then with the last question. I think my special needs child has been wrongfully disciplined. What should I do? This is huge. For 15 years, again, as a public defender representing mostly children in delinquency matters, I would say 45% of my clients were, were on an IEP. 
And one of the things that the, the school has a ton of requirements and steps they need to follow when they go through school discipline with children who are on an individual edu education plan. And, you know, it's, it's time frames. They have to do what's called a manifestation and termination, meaning they have to look at the bad behavior, whatever the bad behavior they're alleging is, you know, ripe for school discipline and see whether or not that bad behavior was a manifestation of their disability. And if it was a manifestation of their disability, that affects whether or not that child can be disciplined. So many times when I was doing my work in a courtroom, the first thing I would do is request that individual educate or that individualized education plan, look through the manifestation determination so that I could then look at the prosecutor and say, look, you know, this kid wasn't punished at school because they, you know, they determined it was part of their disability. So you should also not prosecute this kid in court. But, um, you know, there are also limits on how they can discipline students. How long can a child be removed? Depending on the type of IEP, depending on, you know, the type of accommodations, they have to look at what's the least restrictive alternative for, um, again, that discipline and, and placement at home, for instance, like suspension or expulsion is the last case scenario, worst case scenario. And so they can't just jump there when a child is on an IEP. And then ultimately, at the end of the day, because children are required to have a fair and public education, if there's a child with an IEP and they just want to get rid of them, they have to pay if they can't accommodate. And so those are all considerations. And, and again, if, if you think that there is a disciplinary process, that has gone awry or is not going well for your child in an IEP, absolutely want to talk to an advocate or an attorney um, because steps can and should be taken to assist you through that process. And I'll just say very kind of lastly, the school to prison pipeline is real and it's kind of a buzzword and it's something we don't like to talk about and we're trying to change that. And children with special needs and children who are on IEPs a compass an overwhelming majority of those school to prison pipeline kids. This is when you as a parent are, are being proactive in getting that advocate and getting that attorney to assist in that process because you do not want your child falling behind or falling into that pattern. And so I think that's, Debbie, I think that's our last slide. So just to everybody out there in the community, thank you so much for joining us. We really appreciate being able to have this platform and share with you. Uh, we hope you learned some new things tonight. And, you know, as you go out to the world, if, if you hear people asking about IEPs as they were doing this morning on uh, Real Housewives, please let them know we're here to assist. We're here to help. When we have better education for all our students, it helps all our students. But, you know, in, in each moment, you know, unfortunately, sometimes it's my kid right now. And sometimes you need an advocate to help you with that. And we are here to help you. Look through the slide. You'll see our contact information. We're on Facebook, Instagram, all the stuff. We're, you know, Whitbeck Bennett, WBLaws.com. Contact us. Uh, we'd ha be happy to help. Thanks, guys. Have a good evening.